living icons of the University of Michigan Department of Communications. Hi, I'm Dale Wesley and it's my privilege to interview today one of those icons, a man of uh, great distinction, William B. Stegeth, Ph.D., who not only uh, attended the University of Michigan uh, and earned his degrees here, but later returned as an instructor and then one of only three broadcasters to ever broadcast uh, Michigan football on WUOM. Yes. Well, Bill Fleming was the first, and I was the second, because I worked with him as a um, color guy, we call it in those days. And uh, the third one was Tom Hemingway, who followed me, and after that they discontinued it. Now tell me, did you, like most of us, were you bitten by the bug? Did you want to go into radio early on in your life? I guess I was caught by the bug because it was a new station that came in our town called WDBC, and my mother was doing some readings on it for a local church, and it had a nice radio voice, and I got kind of interested in uh, broadcasting, and then uh, was able to, as a high school kid, first get my toes wet in actual broadcasting through a station of Menominee in Marinette, Wisconsin. Oddly enough, <laughs> they came up to Escanaba and did a 15-minute insert for their weekly tour of the Upper Peninsula, <laughs> which is where I lived at the time. In high school, you were the sound effects man? I remember trying to emulate the squeeding of tires for one of our scripts. And so I got a piece of um, uh, wood, stuck a couple of nails in it, and pulled it over a pane of glass uh, to make the screeching sound <laughs> of tires. And often I hear uh, that same sound effect on today's television <laughs> broadcast, and I kind of wonder how they did it, because sometimes it's not in synchronization, it looks terrible, it sounds terrible. <laughs> how did you imitate horses' hoofs? <laughs> plungers on our chest. <laughs> Here's an example of it, without the plungers. <laughs> you hear that, really? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell and you. Now if they were copying across the street, that's when they, we did that on a uh, kind of a board with uh, kind of pieces of wood mm -hmm. in our hands. It was flopped like that, <laughs> little blocks of wood on a, on a, on a board. WUOM, before it became uh, on the air, before it came on the air, there were radio classes in Michigan. And Waldo Abbott, who was then professor of broadcasting, was the first author, of, was the author of the first book on broadcasting, called Handbook of Broadcasting. Hmm. And in there he had a section on sound effects. <laughs> and uh, so I learned some of those from in there and I contributed some of them. I was going to say, you must have been a consultant to that <laughs> chapter. Sort of. <laughs> broadcasting class, because in those days broadcasting was quite new. And uh, you don't have all the 24-hour um, stuff we had today. And people looked for, in broadcasting, looked for people to be on the air that had a vocal quality that would be favorable to the kind of microphones that were then being used, which were not all, uh, I think their frequency range was probably cut off at about 12. So they were unique, needed to have somebody with kind of a fuller voice, if you could have that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you could get it, sometimes you could, but my mother had a voice that somehow or other was uh, pleasant to hear on those early days of broadcasting. So I got kind of interested in it that way. And then when they had uh, need for summertime announcers or early morning guys, I got a chance to spin some <laughs> records. <laughs> and I could remember, Dale, this will interest you because of the kind of liberation we have of language being used on, 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 on radio and television. The uh, commercial I once read that had the phrase rayon and crepe fabrics in it. And I transposed them. I did a spoon, what they called a spoonerism in those days and called it crayon rapes. <laughs> and rape in the word that day on the radio was a no-no of the first order. <laughs> I thought the FCC was going to come down on the station hard. <laughs> Today, of course, it doesn't even bat an eye when you hear that kind of a word on the radio. Well, Bill, I have to admire you. You're from Escanaba, not exactly the metropolis of the state of Michigan. And you came down here to Ann Arbor, to the University of Michigan, and enrolled as a freshman. I had an aunt here, it was here in early days, and I had an uncle that graduated from pharmacy, 
and was treasurer secretary of his class back in 1908. So it was a second generation, and uh, for me to be here, then we have a, had a third and a fourth. Because I've had my daughters all came to Michigan, two of them, and I have a granddaughter that graduated from Michigan. So she's now in France, living in Paris, France. And, but when you uh, when you got here, weren't you? I mean, you had to be extremely nervous. Right? Well, I, yeah, it was all I'd never been in Ann Arbor before. Oh, you had no, never I'd visited. Never visited. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky, guys. I had an aunt here, and I think that's one reason my parents were not too troubled by my coming down here because I did have that connection with home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Came down here to 1932 Ford V8, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> I majored what was then called speech, yes, Department right, of Speech. Right. And it's and broadened out to become a Department of Communications that had radio, we didn't have any television then, of course. Uh, to be truthful, my freshman year was not a academically very robust. <laughs> I got on I got on probation the first semester, Ooh, wow. hey. <laughs> and I had to really struggle to make sure I got back in the second semester and came here as a sophomore, and uh, to back in school as a sophomore on probation, and that was embarrassing because I prided myself on being at least capable enough to get through the freshman year, but Michigan was tough. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, still is. A lot of people told you know why do you want to go to the University of Michigan? A lot of other schools you would get into and go to you know. Mm -hmm. The other thing was this, Dale, as you can tell even from now, I'm still a rapid speaker. Mm -hmm. Now to me, this is a normal rate. It's not a normal rate to you, it's very rapid. But it's even more rapid when I was in high school. And I think they thought, when I got down here, I'd get into some speech classes and, and get that under control. In those days, we used to have to give a speech of three minutes in length on a platform in a classroom. The most artificial speaking environment that exists. Nobody in their right, Mind ever he has to be in that kind of a situation ever again. Strange. So when I had a chance to teach speech, I changed that format and had him sp sit on the platform with a panel, and they would speak in that way so they get accustomed to see looking at looking at an audience from outside instead of looking at it from the back of their heads. And I remember how petrified I was. Three minutes seemed like an eternity. Mm -hmm. Always. Now, were there any commercial stations in Ann Arbor that you could work for, or, or I mean, did you try to pick WPAG up any? WPAG was here in those days. That was, uh, the Green Brothers started that radio station, and I uh, worked there briefly and served, as a matter of fact, as the uh, Saturday afternoon announcer when Bob Eufer uh, first got his exposure on the air as an assistant to Bill Stern, mm -hmm. who came in to do the Army-Navy game. Army Michigan game, rather, Army Michigan game in 1946. And the WPAG studios were then on the third floor of the Hustle Building in Ann Arbor. And as a result, I sat and listened to the game there, Army, Day, Army Michigan game that day. And uh, then never dreamed, of course, that I would ultimately be on the air myself. But I got interested in it because Bill Fleming, who came to be in Michigan to be uh, work at WUM, was a student in my public speaking and uh, radio class and asked me to serve as his uh, spotter in his Michigan football broadcast and he was the first sports announcer at WUOM hmm. before WUM was even known as WUOM. I, well, I shouldn't say that. We had just gone on the air in 49. Bill Fleming, uh, probably one of the most uh, well-known graduates yeah. of the University of Michigan, yeah. let alone the Department yeah. of Public Speaking Correct. or Department of Speech and Correct. Communication. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Went to New York and became a very successful ABC announcer. And he was, um, he was one of your students? Mm -hmm. Oh, hmm. well that's something you should be very mm -hmm. proud of. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Now you mentioned the name Bob Eufer. Did you know Bob back then? Uh, I mean, Only as a track star. Sounds like he was bitten by the bug too. He was interested in broadcasting uh, mm -hmm. fairly early on. Quite early, yeah. Bob was a track star. He got, he got, he got um, involved in broadcasting when Bill Stern came here to do the Army Michigan game. I think it was in 46. And uh, just to kind of continue the story, uh, when Bob Eufer, uh now you correct me if I'm wrong on this, when Bob Eufer graduated to WJR to uh, do their broad do the broadcast of the mm -hmm. Michigan games on WJR, which mm -hmm. I guess they had exclusive rights for. Mm -hmm. He asked you to be the halftime host. Is that is that how it worked? 
Well, I'll go back a little bit, step just before that, because I was with the Alumni Association at that time. Oh, okay. And Bob Foreman was asked to be the host as representative of the Alumni Association at halftime stuff. Because he was away at all the games away from Ann Arbor. And so they could have him interview local people mm -hmm. as a local voice representing the University Alumni Association, which uh, was a nice opportunity for us in the yeah. Alumni Association. Yeah. And then Bob, uh, after a couple of years of that, was unable to continue that on a regular basis. So they thought it would be bigger, better to have somebody do it regularly yes. as a regular voice. Right. And uh, I was spelling him off on occasion, so they, they just asked me to continue. Bob, you were asking they, Did they know of your background? Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Know about that, yeah. Well, Bill, I want to say something right here publicly. You have, uh, you have an unusual, unique talent of interviewing. <laughs> I, no, I'm seriously. I remember your interviews at halftime of the Michigan broadcast almost as distinctly as I remember the games themselves. And what always was apparent to me, and you can comment on this, you were prepared. You were prepared for the interview. You knew about the person and what you wanted to ask. And the other thing is, you were a good listener. You let the person answer your questions. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not well, trying to put you on the to, spot, uh, but... I, I appreciate that very much because, frankly, I worked pretty hard at it. Yes, I know you did. I wrote out all my intros. All my introductions of my interviews were written out so I knew exactly where I was going. And the questions were all listed. And the... Uh, interview E had a copy of that in front of them. Beforehand remember, or not? Not beforehand. Beforehand. Oh, they did. Okay. They, okay. I gave it to him before the game began okay. so he could okay. look it over before he came in for halftime. Okay. And the purpose of that incident, Dale, was that it put them at ease. Nothing is worse than to be, a, be an interview E and never know what's coming. Right. And right. you stumble around and this gave them a chance to structure their answers. We didn't have a lot of time. We wanted to get information across, and my questioning was always directed at general topics in athletics or mm -hmm. universities. Mm -hmm. I often tried to get the top figure who was visiting Ann Arbor from the visiting team, like an athletic director or in some cases the president of the institution. Mm -hmm. And because of being at WJR, we were able to do that. Now, can you remember any uh, out of those hundreds, I suppose, thousands of interviews that you did, any one or two that immediately come to mind that were... Uh, one comes to mind quickly, of Tom Monahan, who was the founder of Domino's Pizza, in this case. And Tom confided to me, before the interview, that he'd always wanted to be a radio, <laughs> a sports broadcaster in radio, and interview people. I said, Tom, be my guest. This program is yours to go ahead and interview yourself <laughs> in a sense yourself but i think we had another guest in the studio at the same time we put him on and forgot who it was and so tom actually did an interview. <laughs> another quality of yours is you're not beyond telling a joke on yourself about yourself now what i'm thinking of and i want you to tell the viewers this story of when you did <laughs> you know what i'm getting at you did the play-by-play -play of michigan in the College World Series, I think the year was 62, perhaps. Anyway, Correct. you pick, up, you pick yeah. up the story. Well, yes, it was out at Omaha, Nebraska, at the NCAA tournament, I think it was, for the championship of uh, a big uh, college baseball. Don Lund was a coach. And um, I had never done a night game before. And so <laughs> the first ball that was hit Looked like it was going to go out of the park. It was on its way, and I said, "It's a long fly ball," and I'm about to say out near the fence in center field, and it turns out the shortstop caught it, and I had to back off and say, "Caught by the shortstop," <laughs> but I didn't know any other way to do it, but I had to do it, and I apologized. I said. I've not seen a broadcast under lights before. The ball looked like it was out of here. Sorry, folks. No, no. Tell, tell the, tell the viewers what happened later when nature, ah, when, yes. na when Mother Nature called. Well, that's right. I went out to get a coke, <laughs> and uh, they didn't have a lot of amenities in those press boxes in those days. And we had two microphones, one hanging out over for the crowd, one in the, in, in the booth. I turned that one off to go out to the um, uh, restroom and get a Coca-Cola. 
also uh, and came back and started to talk and describe the game and pretty soon the telephone rang <laughs> and the guys in Ann Arbor are calling me and says, where are you? I said, I'm in Omaha. What do you mean, where am I? He said, well, you're not on the air. All we're getting is crowd noise. And I forgot to turn the microphone back on in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> how how long did that go on? Well, it must have been about three or four minutes before they called, five <laughs> minutes or so. I told Bill he he's, he's, has the Guinness Book of Records for broadcasting to the smallest audience himself. <laughs> and there was something else in that broadcast you should know. And that was that the posting team was Santa Barbara. And Santa Barbara had um, uh, uniforms that had Santa Barbara at the front, but no number indication on the front. And the only identification of the players was a number on their back. And when you're looking at the field, all you do is see the front of the players. You never see the backs until they're at bat. And so they had a pitcher in the ball game who had been replaced, and I did not know it <laughs> for a couple of innings <laughs> because I never saw the so name on his back. <laughs> the number on his back. <laughs> Oh, so I don't think broadcasting baseball, today is a little bit easier. I don't think baseball was your forte, so no, we wasn't. say. But uh, in fact, I never broadcast a baseball game like I came here to WUM. Right. And I remember doing one down there at uh, then. I don't think it was called Fisher Field in those days. It was still the baseball diamond, and not really knowing what I was doing. I yeah. I listened to some broadcasters when I was a kid over WGN Chicago and the UP, which was a station that came in very strong. And he had a sports announcer by the name of Bob Elson there in those days. Mm -hmm. And I listened to him. And so my broadcasting was kind of a copy of what he did. And he sort of had an instinct for it. He once asked me what I, what I thought was the most uh, difficult game to broadcast. And I pointed out baseball, I thought, was. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it was the long intervals. Yeah. But the easiest and the nicest game to broadcast, I always thought, was basketball. Mm. Lots happening. Lots happening there. Lots happening. Up and down the court. Or along with hockey. But hockey was tough. Because the environment of hockey is so fast and you can't right. get the looks on the numbers right. very quickly. Right. So you don't know who's got the puck. I agree. And if you're trying to describe puck movement, yeah. which is the essence of the game, you don't have much happening and all of a sudden there's a shot. Mm -hmm. In basketball, you've got this kind of continuing action. And in those days, basketball was a little, was fast break basketball, a little less uh, like it is. Today it's a little bit more controlled, a little more planned. It's interesting to watch the different styles of defense they have. So there was a flow in basketball that I thought was much easier to use and, 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 and describe. Now, in your years of play-by-play, -play, who were the great athletes in your mind that performed for the University of Michigan? Any few that just come immediately to mind that you uh, remember uh, very fondly? A young man by the name of John Tidwell was an artist on the basketball court. He had, in those days where he had still only the two-point shot, he didn't have a three-point line. But he could stand out there uh, almost half court, but a little, maybe in about 10 feet from the midline, and popped that ball up there on a, just a regular basis, and he's popped those things in there. And uh, I remember him distinctly, and of course you remember um, it's, oh. um, Burton. Oh, M.C. Burton? M.C. Burton. What a class guy, and what a beautiful basketball player. Hmm. And there were some others that I remember vaguely, I don't remember their name, I can remember, and see them playing. Uh, one was uh, Tom Jorgensen, who was a guard, Hmm. who played very skillfully. Another one was a kid from Ludington, Michigan, whose name, uh, Pete Tillotson, was a tall kid. We got to know each other quite a while, and I used to room with him on the road. Pete was a nice young man. I've lost track of those young men. I kind of regret that we don't have a chance to find out who some of these kids are and what happens to them later in life. Now, Pete would be in his 50s or 60s now, and I kind of wonder, what did he do with his life? I, hmm. I'm sorry I've lost track of him. What about Tom Harmon? Did he precede you? Tom did, and Tom was in the, uh, the broadcast booth when I sat in the corner of Michigan Stadium as a freshman in the fall of 1938. And Tom had just graduated in 41 and was doing the broadcast for WJR Radio at that time, the only radio, of course. And I remember thinking to myself, gee, I wonder if I'll ever get a chance to do that. I kind of had a yen and thinking, what a wonderful thing it would be to be a broadcaster of a football game at Michigan. Wow. And I had not done any play-by-play, -play, but I'd, I'd done a little bit of uh, high school uh, mm -hmm. action, but not much. There was no high school broadcast at that time, but I tried to emulate it. And I remember how, um, in, in a way, kind of envious that Tom had this opportunity to do that, never thinking in my lifetime that I'd ever be up doing it for <laughs> WJR somewhat years later. 
Now, when you came here as a freshman, were you here literally on campus between that time and the time that you retired? I mean, was there a continuous employment uh, on your part of different? I know you were in the. Uh, yeah, in I've, the, I've, uh, I've, my whole working career has been at Michigan. Right. Isn't that wonderful? Came down, you know, with Mark and Marvelous. I, you know, there's a lot of talk about inbreeding and stuff like that. I realize that people do talk about that. I always felt in today's and in my times, ease of communication with people, that wasn't quite a big a problem. You didn't have to go to another campus to learn what they were thinking or doing. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. now had the communication techniques that got you mm -hmm. together. And I uh, felt a strong association in Michigan. I was asked to teach here. I did not apply for the job. I was just asked to teach as a teaching fellow. And then I was uh, uh, asked to be uh, on WUM staff. And then from there, I was asked to be at the Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I didn't have to apply for any of the jobs. <laughs> and for a while, just to kind of conclude, and for a while you were uh, I had you were in charge of the camp up north, were you not? I was very fortunate to be asked to be the first director of Camp Michigan. Yes, mm -hmm. and I regard that as one of my. I look back at my life and I regard that uh, establishment of that camp and setting the tone and all of it over a ten-week period as probably my major uh, contribution to my professional life. I had the opportunity to do lots of other things. But going to the camp and setting the tone for that camp, which carried a little bit of my family background into a public arena. My mother was a hospitable kind of person. We had a lot of people in my family life coming and going. So when I went to the Camp Michigan, that was a natural extension of that mm -hmm. kind of living. And I was very proud of the fact that it was so successful, not just because of me, obviously. We had great staff and we had a great kitchen and all those things that go to making a camp and great alumni who came and wanted this experience and contributed to it and came back to wherever they went and told people and bragged about it. So we had a lot going for us after the first couple of weeks and people that heard about it. Yes, I was very lucky to be the first guy. <laughs>